I would like to introduce our speaker. Um, I actually met Cozy Whitman at a CPA conference. And Dave Sennis, I think you might have actually been at that conference as well. Um, and Cozy and I got to know each other because we were both exhibitors there. And when I found out what she did, I thought it was a phenomenal um, opportunity for our club to learn how to help fund college tuition. And so um, she says, the cost of college is a concern of people of all ages. The tips that Cozy will share can help us understand how to strategically approach the large financial decision, whether you're approaching it from a parent, grandparent, or student perspective. Cozy is excited to continue to extend to reach the college inside track to connect with organizations, families that are interested in learning more about the complex college process. And, and those of you, um, the thing you might be interested about our club is that we help kids um, in Bloomington fill out the, the FAFSA forms because even that is a challenge for families that don't even know that exists. So she's going to take us deeper into what other opportunities there are for kids to help get funding for college. So with that, Cozy, you're welcome to join us. Thank you. So I'm super excited to be here. Thank you very much uh, for inviting me, Deb. Um, I've presented at other Rotaries, and I find um, this to be an amazing organization. Honestly, I didn't know very much about Rotary before I started connecting uh, to do this talk. And so um, amazing work that you, that you do. I live in Lakeville, so I'm thinking I need to look up Lakeville Rotary <laughs> is what I need to do. Or not. Or, <laughs> or here, right? I live in Lakeville. Awesome. Oh, right. well, there you go. <laughs> I'm going to have to like hide on my way out now. Um, so I am here today because I was once a client of College Inside Track. I have five kids of my own. I have done five college searches, each and every single search different, because each and every kid is different, right? Um, and what I found myself doing last spring was kind of evaluating my career and trying to figure out what on earth do I want to do with the next 10 years of my career. And one of the things I found myself doing every time I ran into a family who was getting ready to do the college search or buried in the college search was literally taking everything I had ever learned from College Inside Track as a client and putting it out on the table, right, to the point where people were like, that's cozy, don't talk to her, you know, don't go her way. Um, because I'm passionate about this. It makes me crazy that kids are hamstrung when they launch out of college because they've taken on so much debt and it doesn't have to be that way. And so what I want to do today is really take you through the longer version of this is actually seven tips, but I have to condense it because I only get a half hour. Um, and so you'll get four tips. Um, but here's what I want to tell you on your tables. There is a form, and if you're interested in the other three tips, uh, if you want to fill out that form for me, one of the boxes you can check is to get the full presentation, and I'm happy to send that to you. So just know that that's there, because we always end up running out of time at the Rotary, because you guys always have great questions. The other option that you have on that, and I am, as mentioned, just passionate about this. If you today work with an organization that works with high school kids, I would love to bring this presentation to the parents and families of that group. It is important information that parents need to know and too many do not. And I can tell you every family I meet with, every family says, I didn't know any of this stuff. Um, so it's really important, reserve your checkbox until you, we've gone through some of this, but I think you'll find this is really cool information that people should know. So who is College Inside Track? We're a local company. We're privately held. There are seven of us now, uh, so it's a relatively small organization. Um, and we work nationally and actually internationally, working with families to really help them figure out how to navigate through the college search process. On average, we save families about $75,000 off the cost of college. It's about $18,800 a year. So we're going to start here. I'm not going to tell you this is my dorm room, but it could be my dorm room. Um, and the point in starting here is back in the day, I grew up in Iowa. Um, my parents looked at me and said, cozy, Iowa or Iowa State, which one? 
right? There was no like, where do you want to tour? How far from home do you want to be, right? Two local schools, frankly, I chose correctly. I became a cyclone, um, yeah, right? Go clones. Um, primarily because we had football season tickets. <laughs> That's why I made that choice. Um, and so the reality is today, you could make that choice, you could fumble around back in 1987, and it didn't cost you too much. Today, if you're fumbling around and trying to figure out your path, it costs you a whole lot of money. The college search process has changed, and what I find is people go into the search, families go into the search, like that one emoji with the heart eyeballs, um, where colleges look at this as a business because that's what it is for them. And in the gap between business and hard eyeballs lies debt. And so what I hope to teach you guys today is a little bit about how to strategically play the college game the way the colleges are playing it. College Inside Track thinks about a successful college search, including three things. And if you pull all three of these together, you end up with kids who are excited to go to school, who know exactly what to expect on day one, and who can afford it, the school they attend. You want to hit the right academic rigor for the student, meaning it has some of the majors they're thinking about, or at least some of the areas they're considering. And it's the right rigor for them. You want to hit the right cultural or social fit for the student. And then ultimately, you want to make sure that it meets the goals of the family financially. So we're going to start with a quiz. Let's see how smart the room is. Since 1987, how much has tuition gone up at the University of Minnesota as a percentage? 28%, 77%, 215%, 1.5%, 570, or you should pull out your T1, because this is a very big calculation. OK, who says 28? Anybody? Any takers at 28? No, because everybody's so cynical. How about, how about 77? Anybody? Takers? 215? 570? And the winner is 570%. You want an eyeball popper? I did this presentation for estate planners in Wisconsin, so they don't care about University of Minnesota. So I did it for University of Wisconsin, 1,053% in that same time frame. Relative bargain, private colleges have only gone up 360%. So here's a little state of the state. Um, keep in mind, this is not just tuition, obviously. This is the full cost to attend for a year. Obviously at the top, um, some East Coast schools, but getting down into the middle there, some of our local faves, and then at the bottom, University of Minnesota now passed a milestone two years ago. It will cost you more than $100,000 to get a degree at University of Minnesota. Consequently, a college education now is the second largest investment a family will make. We would suggest that you approach it as strategically as you are approaching your financial investments. Most families do not. Also, gone are the days where a kid can just work his way through school or her way through college. I don't know a single part-time job that a full-time student could take on that would allow them to earn $26,000 a year. We would also offer that more people know more about buying their next big screen TV than they know about the college they're getting ready to send their child off to from a financial perspective. And it's not our fault as consumers. It is not easy to do a search. I uh, met with a family the other day. They came here from Spain, shell-shocked at the idea that they needed money for college. They had no idea. Uh, and so their child was a downhill skier, competitive downhill skier, wants to be a mechanical engineer. They tried to Google that. No such thing. You can't do that Google search. Not effectively, anyway. Consequently, because it's hard to do the research, people end up here, right? Lining up, jumping off into the pit of debt. The average family takes on about $48,000 in loans. I just got off the phone with a financial advisor 
parents trying to figure out which loan should I do parent plus should we do the student loan that the state of Minnesota gives out what should we do and they were mortified by the idea that they're co-signing on loans which in essence means this is their debt the average student takes on thirty seven thousand dollars in student debt the average family or parents take on eleven so is that the most depressing five minutes? Y'all were so happy when I got up here, and now you're like, Ugh. So we're gonna talk about how do families navigate this. There are two kinds of aid in the system. This is one of the biggest myths to date. Two kinds of aid. One based on, who knows? Need, very good. The other based on? Merit. Merit. You guys are the smartest group I have presented to in months. I'm not kidding about that. Um, yeah, <laughs> that's right. Well done, Bloomington. <laughs> so here's what you need to know about these buckets of money. They are completely separate, completely separate buckets of money. Some families will get to draw off both. Some will only get to draw off one, but every family gets the opportunity to draw off one. Two forms you need to determine your fiscal need as a family. Who knows one? Everybody knows one. Yeah. Right? Because you guys help with that. Anybody know the second? Anyone fill this bad boy out? What? Pell grants or pension? No. Nope. It's called the CSS profile. It's four pages. It is the most painful document you will ever fill out in your life. I physically felt money leaving my bank accounts as I felt it out right? Because everything is fair game. Everything about your finances goes on there. Every single thing. So biggest influencers of financial aid for families, income, assets, number of kids you have in college, and their assets, which leads us to tip number one. If need might be an option for a family, they should move assets out of the children's name. Assets in the children's name are assessed at a 20% rate. If you're the parent, it's only assessed at about 5.5%. So consequently, your money goes four times further if it's in the parent name. Yes, ma'am. Just a quick one. Does that include Roths? Uh, so Roths are considered a retirement account. They do not go on to the FAFSA. Great question. What about 529 accounts? So what a great question. Thank you. <laughs> great segue. Well done, Mary. <laughs> So they take uh, your total and they say, of this, per, of this pool of money, 20% of it should be assigned to paying for college if you're a kid, and five and a half-ish should be assigned to paying for college if you're a family or a parent. I have a 529 account. It says that parent's rate, um, yep. but does that assume that it's the parent is the owner? So generally speaking, the parents are the owner. That's a great question, so let's talk about that. If it's a parent 529, it is assessed at the parent rate, okay? When 529s were set up, they were set up with the assumption that they're going to pay for college, right? So they fit in this special bucket of, it's okay, we're not gonna count it at the kid rate. UGMAs or UPMAs, which you might also have, are actually assessed at the child rate. So just know that. Grandparent 529s, though, are magical because they have no reporting status whatsoever. They go nowhere. Yes. Here's the trick. If you can, delay distribution of that grandparent 529 until the last FAFSA a child will fill out, which is in October of their junior year. Most kids pay monthly, okay? So they set up payment plans. Pay September of junior year, fill out that FAFSA ASAP, October 1 of that junior year, and then start using the grandparent money to pay for the rest of junior year and all of senior year. Here's why. Once the money shows up at the college for the kid, it becomes their asset. And the next year FAFSA, it gets assessed at 20%. So if you can delay, and here's what I always tell people, if grandma and grandpa have set aside, I don't know, $100,000 for you as a child, that's a bummer, but 
gosh, don't worry about it too much, right? <laughs> but if you have, say, a grandparent 529 with just like, I don't know, 20 or $25,000 in it, where it's not going to pay for multiple years, then wait to disperse it until that junior year if you can. Does that make sense? Awesome. How do you actually do that? In, uh, your, in your 529 uh, form, yeah. you make that allocation? So you just tell them. Yeah, no, I, I, yeah, yeah. We, we, I've done all that, but I'm just trying to think of how do you wait until there is the distribution? How do you build that into the uh, document? So most you call and tell them where and when to send, right? And so just let it sit there and accumulate until junior year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great question. Other questions? All right, that is all we're going to spend on need, partly because people are either need-based or they are not. The other thing that you need to know that most people don't, there's not a singular need number, right? The government uses a number to decide what kinds of loans you qualify for, but the colleges define need differently at every single school, every single school. So don't assume just because you're not need-based at this school that you won't be at this school. Uh, we were talking earlier, and I mentioned that you probably have read it, the uh, Hillbilly Elegy by J.D. Vance. Uh -huh. Okay. <laughs> uh, the point being in there, he talks about going to the University of Ohio and then wanting to go to law school. Uh, and he had mentors that convinced him after a lot of work to apply to Ivy League schools. Mm -hmm. And because of the need based, yep. by going to a more expensive school, yep. it cost him less That's right. than to a state school. That's right. So the biggest mistake, and we'll get to this, right, um, is that merit's the same across the board. It is not. Uh, and if you're a need based family, the Ivy Leagues are saving their endowments for you, right? The challenge is the acceptance rate, right? So the Ivy Leagues all have acceptance rates at less than 10%. And personally, I don't want to roll the dice for any kid and build their entire list off, off that premise for that reason. Um, because they're competing with brilliant kids with lots of need from all over the world now, not just that state, that region, or just the country, right? So. Um, that's 100% true and one of the biggest myth areas probably that sits out there. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up. Um, so we'll, uh, with that, we'll jump into merit aid unless you have other questions around need. Okay, so merit aid's way more fun because it's all about amazing and wonderfulness around the child. It has nothing to do with your income. You can make $10 million a year, $50 million a year, $100 million a year, and your child can still get merit aid. To get the most merit aid, however, you have to be looking at the right schools, and that goes back to your point. Do not chase private scholarships with the exception of the Rotary. Right. The organizations that you know and love and that parents belong to or grandparents belong to, fine. Do not spend endless hours, however, chasing down those other private scholarships, right? Where you go out to the website and they give you the 20,000 potential scholarships you could be applying to, here's why. Only 7% of the money in the system available for families comes from those. 35% come from the colleges themselves in the form of scholarships and grants. The number one mistake families make in the merit aid bucket, they assume all colleges offer. So the counter to your um, example is the call we get every spring. Brilliant child, 5.5 weighted GPA, um, they got a 36 on the ACT, started a business out of their bedroom, applied to all the Ivy Leagues, can't wait to go. They get the financial packages back, and guess what? They can't afford a single school on the list. And now the parents are trying to talk their child off a ledge. The parents are like, what on earth are we going to do? Because when were application deadlines? 
way back in the fall and spring or Christmas time ish. What are their options? Not very many of them, I can tell you, because they made the opposite assumption. They assumed the Ivy Leagues were going to give their kid gobs of money because I'm brilliant. Or they make the assumption they're going to go to the University of Minnesota on a full ride. It's a myth. It doesn't happen and it doesn't exist. There are basically three buckets. The schools that give their endowments for need-based students who do sometimes get full rides. Then state schools tend to sprinkle across gobs of kids, right? So they move the needle a mm, couple thousand, three thousand, four thousand, five thousand dollars at a time. Third bucket are schools that use their endowments for the benefit of the students coming in. And those are the schools that most people don't look at because they are public, private. private. That's right. And people think, no way, I can't pay $68,000 a year. And so they don't even walk down that path. And we're going to walk down this path for them. So look for schools who, one, give merit aid. Not all of them do. Two, where your kid brings something special to the table. For instance, their academics, which is a big driver regardless of school, kind of school. Anywhere where the child brings ACT scores and GPAs that bring them in in the upper 25% of that college's incoming freshman class. Okay. Extracurricular talents. Last year we had a child who danced hip hop all through high school. She was going to leave it behind. She wanted to be a pre-med major. One of the schools saw and through conversation heard, right, she dances hip hop. They were kind of interested in that because they had a team and they wanted some holes filled. They came to her and said to the tune of $12,000 a year on top of her other academic aid that she was getting, we'd like you to dance hip hop. Guess what? She's dancing hip hop this year. Gender ethnicity. If you can move the needle some way for this college, they're just like the businesses you guys work for, right? Y'all have metrics that you're measuring. Colleges are the exact same way. So if you have a woman going into the STEM fields, right? The Michigan Institute of Technology would like to talk to you because they have a high population of men. If you are a male and you want to go into nursing, another great option. My daughter is a dancer. I was down at UMKC. She's getting her BFA in dance. This kid walks in front of her, she's like, I hate that kid. I'm like, what? We don't hate, honey, right? The classic mom response. She's like, no, he's here on a full ride. He's never danced a day of ballet in his life, and they gave him a full ride. He was a dancer before, but not ballet, and guess what? Those guys are a rare commodity. So they gave him a lot of money. Questions? Yeah? This is an odd question, but that gender question is starting to change. And yeah. so how are they addressing that? Because Possible. Yeah, it's true, right? So, um, so now the big driver for a lot of colleges is not so much gender as it is ethnicity, right? They're looking for a great ethnic mix. mix. Excuse me. Um, I challenge you tonight, go to any college website, I don't care what it is, pull it up. And their landing page has a beautiful spray of men and women of every ethnicity imaginable. Which brings us to our next tip. Consider colleges in other states. Because right under this beautiful spray of young adults is a statement that says something like, we have one child from all 50 states and 37 countries around the world. Right? Demographics matter very much to colleges. So anything your child can do to move that needle is a good thing. Seems counterintuitive, I know. But consequently, here's what happens. Most kids, even though they talk big, every kid I've met with in the last two weeks, they can't wait to get as far as possible from mom and dad, right? But when it comes around to actually choosing, guess what? Most of them go no more than 50 miles from their house. So consequently, Minnesota colleges have all the Minnesotans they can use. <laughs> they don't need any more. Um, just by stepping over the border, you are now unique. Right? Now, understand at the big state schools, 
that's not going to apply. Yes, you're playing out-of-state tuition. The key is to figure out how to play the game against them, right? Or with them, you could think about it too, right? You, uh, Michigan schools, if you want to be a Trojan or a Spartan, you're paying full price, full out-of-state tuition. However, if you look at the smaller state schools, they are now competing with the private colleges. And guess what? All of their smaller state schools have gotten rid of their out-of-state tuition. Everybody starts with in-state. And if you're the private colleges and you give merit aid, you don't even have an in-state, out-of-state, right? You start with a sticker price and then you start chopping away at it. For some schools, this can be worth up to $15,000 a year times four. So this will be the most fun you spend today. It baffles me. I hope, honestly, by giving this presentation, I hope uh, that there's pushback. There starts to be pushback, that people understand how this works and they want to make it easier and simpler, right? But today, this is what it looks like. So because we know people who know people, we got how to make a sausage from one school. They shared their secret sauce with us. Um, and what I want you to do while we go through these is not pay attention to the amounts of money assigned, but to the categories at which they are giving money. The first one is demonstrated interest. What on earth is that? How do you demonstrate interest? Apply. apply? It can be easier than that even. Touring. Even easier than touring, but yes, that applies. Email yes. <laughs> Protest. <laughs> Um, yes, all you have to do is go out to the college website and ask them for more info. Will they spam you to death? Yes, they will, Iowa State University. <laughs> um, however, um, it already puts you on their radar because you can do all the research you need pretty much on this school without really them ever knowing about you. And they have to know about you so they know how many to convert to students to get the numbers they need, right? Then, what we know, the study came out about a month and a half ago, kids who tour, wherever that came from up here, kids who tour a school more than once get almost twice the merit aid as kids who never go at all and just apply. So do not wait until September or October of the senior year to start poking around at colleges because you limit the amount of time you actually have to interact with them. If you live out of state at this school, you get between two and 15 grand. For every A on the kid's transcript, starting freshman year to um, senior, they give 62 bucks. If you take harder coursework, AP, PSEO, IB coursework, you get 400 bucks. Excellent letter of recommendations, worth pretty much a fair amount of money here, right? So by the way, students, don't ask your teacher on October 30th to write that letter of recommendation for you because it might not be so shiny. <laughs> um, if you increase the ACT score over their incoming average, remember we talked about the incoming average trying to come in at 20 to 25 percent above that. If your child does that, at this school $425 for every point above the average you are. So if the school is a 26 average, and your child has a 32 or your grandchild has a 32, that's a fair amount of money. Just for filling out the FAFSA. Doesn't have anything to do with the fact that you're need-based or not need-based. Just because you filled out the form, they're gonna give you almost $2,000. How come? They learn about you. Yes. They get your financial information. Why are just I mean, I I've heard from people now that it's required that the parents fill that out. So it's not required if you never want to take out a student loan ever. But I've however, that yeah. However, at schools who give merit aid, they make it table stakes in essence, right? They won't unlock the aid and give it to you until you fill it out. That's why. The financials are so important to these guys. That's why they pay you for it, right? Why? Because Drake University can call you every other day of your life and ask you to contribute <laughs> to their endowment after your child graduates. Yes? Cozy, can you uh, cover average score, ACT scores nationally in Minnesota? Yeah, so uh, that's a great question that I don't know the answer to, to be honest. 
Most schools run in the 25 to 26 range, um, but obviously it depends a lot on the school, right? So if you're Harvard, your average ACT is way up here at 35, 36. Um, and if you're a community college, it's down at 19, 20, 21. Um, and so it's hard to say, is what I would say, institutionally. Because it doesn't really matter what the kid got, it matters more what the average is for this school. That's how it benefits them. So when families say to me, what more can my kid be doing? My answer is, let's take what they're doing today and find schools that value that instead of the other way around, instead of you making your kids crazy. Yeah. Oh, five minutes. Yeah. Oh, thank you. <laughs> if you fill out that CSS profile, recall I said it's more painful. They pay you more. Um, the essay here pretty important. You can get almost $9,000 if you have a well-written essay, which is why we have an essay coach that works with our kids to help put the most polished uh, version of their voice out to the schools. And then this school actually deducts stuff for like uh, declaring a common major like business. They'd rather you come in undeclared and figure it out for whatever reason, which is why I always tell parents, like, stop sweating it. If your kid does not know what they want to do at 18, stop sweating. It's not a big deal. Tip number four, you can negotiate your award. For the schools in this third bucket that we talked about, who are giving merit aid based on all those categories, those schools you can have a conversation with and you can negotiate your aid package. It's called an appeal. It's a dark underbelly. Most schools will not tell you that you can do this and most parents accept it on terms. Now, you cannot negotiate with University of Minnesota. You cannot negotiate with UMD, NDSU, any state college where they're using academics as the driver. You can't negotiate that. However, for schools basing it on this kind of random list of stuff, you absolutely can. You need a reason. Maybe your financial situation has changed as a family. Or, more fun, you got a better offer. This is just like a job offer. So I'll use my own example. One of my kids applied to four schools. One was Coe College in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, and one was Drake University down in Des Moines. Coe came back with a package at $9,000 a year, everything. Room and board, tuition, the whole nine yards, nine grand. I'm cheering Coe, like I'm super excited about that, right? Drake comes back at $26,000 a year. I'm much less excited about Drake University, right? However, Elise, from the time her baby toe hit Drake University, loved Drake. Wanted to go to Drake, wouldn't consider any other school than Drake. I love Drake, Mom. You don't know how much I love Drake. So we took, with the help of College Inside Track, because I wasn't working with them then, Jay, our advisor, took Coe's package, wrote the appeal, Elise sent it off to the school, and they said, well, we can't do nine, but we'll come back to you with 7,000 additional dollars. And so Drake went from $26,000 down to 18, just like that. Our goal as a family was to be less than the University of Minnesota. That's what I told my kids. Instantly, we're done. She's excited. I would have still loved Co, frankly, but. <laughs> on average, College Inside Track saves families about $8,000 on appeal. So what do we do? We're a little like a real estate agent, if you will. So kids come to us, families come to us. Here's what we need from an academic perspective, a social perspective, and a financial perspective. We find them colleges that can meet those goals, and then we help them walk through the process. We help them navigate all the way through, because sadly, it's more complex than it used to be, and you could use some navigation. We do save families gobs of money. And lastly, this is my favorite slide, because this is what they did for me, right? We are a neutral third party. We get kids to do things that their parents have asked 27 times, right? <laughs> Four of my five kids are girls. They have mastered the eyeball role, right? And I'm always, you know, they love me, and they think I'm pretty awesome, but I'm never the smartest person in the room, right? If there's somebody else there, they're definitely no more than I do. Um, so our services, or about 3,800 bucks, just under four grand. To roll all the way through, we also guarantee it, right? So we'll find 3,895 in merit aid or we will refund the difference. 
Here's what I will do for anybody in this room or anybody you know. On that sheet of paper, there is an opportunity to do a free hour of consulting. I'm happy to do it. What do we do during that free hour? I'm going to answer any questions you have based on your own personal college search. These were great tips. I didn't share all of them. Um, but every family is different, and they don't apply to every single family, right? So what we will do is offer to come in, sit down with you, figure out what your child wants, and go from there. We will help you estimate your expected family contribution. And lastly, again, help decide, are you going to be need or merit? And if you're merit, what school should you be thinking about? What strategies should you be employing? So I'm just going to make my plea one more time. I am not kidding when I say the reason that I stand here and do this is because it makes me crazy if I hear about one more kid going to the University of Iowa to become a teacher to the tune of $42,000 a year. I'm going to cry, not just because they're going to be a Hawkeye. <laughs> right? Because you are overpaying for that education you don't need to. I have a question. I know, um, let's just say, fortunately, a child doesn't need financial aid. How do um, all these numbers of their status fit into their acceptance at the college level without financial aid? Right. So it would come back in the form of scholarships and grants from the college, right? But you have to have put the right due diligence on the front side of the search. Um, so if they're not um, going to be a need-based family, I would just say to people who, who say, look, we don't have limits on what we can spend on college. Um, don't you want the best value? I still do, right? So um, I know you guys got to go. Uh, let me just um, take your two questions, and then I will stick around, and you're welcome to ask. My, mine is, where do two-year colleges at very low cost on yes. a transfer? Where do those students fit in? How well do they fit in? Yeah, so that's a great question. Two-year to transfer is not always the least expensive option. In fact, sometimes it ends up being a more expensive option than just starting at the right schools who have given you the right merit aid package. Kids lose a lot of money in the transfer process, and so here's what we tell people. That can always be an option, right? So that should stay on the plate, but you should do the full four-year search first, keeping in mind all the schools that are going to give you merit aid, and then when spring comes around and you have all the numbers laid out, then make your decision. And if it turns out that it's still two-year to transfer is less expensive, then go that way, right? Um, but often, the merit-based schools will make it worth your while to start with them because two-year to transfer, they cannot count in their four-year graduation rates. And so they don't give as much merit aid when they go that direction. I have two. I don't know if I can ask you both. But I wanted to know if there's still much scholarship going on for Adage kids doing the Adage program. And then recommendations, can they come from people other than teachers? They can. Coaches are great. Um, I always... Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you know them personally is what I would say. So what we tell kids is think about the people who know you best and can write a very personalized letter of recommendation. I think that's great. And I don't know the answer to the AVID question. I'm sorry. Uh, but I can look it up. If you um, either write that on your form or give me a card, I'll look it up and share it with you. Mm -hmm. Very good. I will stick around for questions. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.